Hey, how you doing everybody? This is John and we're doing another video of traveling with John. We are over here at Cascade Caverns and we are going to be going to the cave. That's my tour guide right over there. Hey, how you doing? And that's the gift shop right over here. So we're going to be starting our tour right over here right now. All right. You ready to go? I'm ready if you're ready. Okay, let's go. And uh, my, he's going to give me my flashlight. You want me to take it? Yeah, thank you, sir. All right. You ever been in a cave before? Uh, yeah, I went to the uh, Natural Bridge Caverns. Okay, cool. So this is my second one. Nice. We have a little bit of a different cave system down here. We have a really active system, so it's going to be dripping on us. It's going to be kind of raining in them just a little bit, so to speak. Biggest thing is, I'm sure they told you at Natural Bridge as well, just please don't touch anything and get inside. Hmm. I will say with great flashlight comes great responsibility. I'm trying to shine that light on my friend. So you're going to be seeing some bats, some salamanders. I'm really good friends with them. As long as they don't shine lights right on them, take flash photos, they'll keep resting and chilling. We prefer that today. Okay, so you don't want me to put the flashlight on them? Just not directly on them, yeah. Okay, sure. all right, no problem. And then uh, if you do have any questions at any point, fire away. There's no bad questions on a cave tour. I've asked them all myself. If I don't know the answer to your question, we get back up top. I'm really good at Googling things. We'll figure it out one way or another. Okay. I know it's a packed house. We'll try to stick together, not get too lost or separated. <laughs> Try to stay behind me at all times, except for two spots. First place is right here at this impenetrable gate. If you want to line up along this wall, we'll get started. All right. Okay, so we're going to start our tour right over here. Start to make our way down this way. I'm going to get behind this tree before I start to talk about stuff. Welcome to Cascade Caverns. I'm going to thank you for coming out today. You're actually standing in the lowest spot in Kendall County, Texas right now. Every time it rains, storms, or pours, next day that water's heading right for us. Messes up our stuff pretty good. You can see this frame of a building. This is actually a theater they built in the 1960s. Originally constructed, they had a projector on the back wall. That would show a slideshow of tour safety guidelines to the front. Flood in 2002 came and took away everything from what's standing right now. So what we'll find out throughout our tour is we have quite a history of flooding messing up all of our stuff. We'll dive into that slowly but surely though. As we walk down the path, you can see there's a creek bed to your right. This is one of two main sources of our flooding. You can take a deep breath. It is dry today, so no worries. We're heading down below this afternoon. And then across the creek bed over there, you can see that white stone house. That was built in 1951. Yes, sir. Final house built on the property by the founder of the caverns, a man named Alfred Gray. He discovered the cave system in 1929. He started giving tours in 1932 second cavern in the whole state of Texas to actually provide tours to the general public. Originally, you come to the building behind me to my left. That is the original ticket booth. They built that in 1931. Only reason the building has lasted the test of time so well is the rock it's made from. Same rock that makes our cavern. It's called Glenrose Limestone. It kind of works like a sponge. It's very porous. The limestone will actually absorb water over time. And then as it starts to get released, that creates all the tiny holes that you see in the rock now. We're going to see a lot of the holes as we get down below today. Walking past, you are more than welcome to feel this limestone since it's already above the ground. Get an idea of what it feels like. Perhaps get it out of your system for a second. And on the inside, a lot of antiques. We'll try to keep it as authentic to the 30s as we can. Cash register that it's against the back wall is the very first register ever used in 1932. Sign in the back of the register reads Master Charge, not Master Card. I hadn't gotten to the name change quite yet in 30. And what originally costed a whopping 10 cents per ticket out here. Fortunately for all of us, this thing called inflation exists. You've probably heard about that recently. Walking across the bridge, take a look to your left. You see the stairs we'll be heading down shortly. And you can also notice in the creek bed there's these stone walls. Essentially, these are working as levees. So if this creek bed does start to catch water, slow it down. Don't make it too easy to get below inside the cavern. This is the most famous bridge on Cascade Caverns property, not just because I think it's the only bridge out here, but this is actually filmed in a movie. 1992, the Disney company was out here. They filmed a movie called Fatherhood, which did star the late great Patrick Swayze. About 10 minutes of the film, roughly, are shot out here. You can see Patrick Swayze and his pretend kids hiding underneath the bridge, hiding down inside the cave as well. It's also where we got that big old green dinosaur from Rex. He was a prop in the movie. 
They were done filming. They gave them to us. A little going away present. He's been keeping guard of the park ever since. And while Fatherhood may be Patrick Swayze's lowest rated film on IMDb, I can assure you it's the best Patrick Swayze movie sold inside of our gift shop. And then right over here is the original entry point. This is what we call the peep in the deep. This is a 65 foot hole in the ground that goes all the way to the cave entrance below. This is how the caverns got discovered. In 1929, the owner of the property, Mr. Gray, was a dairy farmer. He bought the land for his cows to roam. One day, one of his cows roams a little too far, discovers the peep in the deep for him. The cow takes a long fall. Mr. Gray goes to get the remains, finds a cave waiting for him. A few days later, he's at a feed store in town. He starts talking about this cavern he found on his property. One of the people he was speaking to had just got done mapping out Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. A man named Frank Nicholson. He let him know, hey, they're making money out west. You can try in central Texas. We opened up three years later in 32, and at that point, this is the way you're going in and out for tours. Originally, they would take a rope and attach it to Mr. Gray's truck. The other end of the rope is attached to a metal drum. So you get in the metal drum, you put the truck in reverse, lower you to 65 down. Tour ends, you get back in the metal drum, you put the truck in drive, and hoist you on out of there. Surprisingly, Mr. Gray's insurance company wasn't thrilled with the rope and bucket system. They insisted he build the stairs that we'll start to walk on now. But to give you an idea of what they once had to work with, over here to your right, you're going to do one of the metal drums that lower you in and out of the cavern inside. So you can take a nice look at the bucket, good look at the steps, decide for yourself which way looks more enjoyable today. The okay. steps do. <laughs> That's what everybody says going down the stairs. I'll ask you again when we start walking back up. For the most part, these stairs are the originals. They completed them mid to late 1940s. When they were building the stairs, they did one blast and the stairs could lead straight inside of our cavern. That one blast ended up giving us all of the Glen Rose limestone that'll be lining our trails in and out today. And then when we do get inside the cavern shortly, no blast necessary on the interior. All the walls and ceilings of the cavern is just carved out by a whole lot of water and a whole lot of time. Flooring, I readily admit, man-made a little bit. They paved everything in the 50s to make it an easier walking path. Now it is considered a man-made structure, the floors, that is. We still make updates here and there as needed after flooding. area we're now standing in is what we call the sunken gardens. All of the plant, trees, and cactus out here all get washed this way every big flood that heads for us. Last time all of this is underwater and completely sunken was the 2002 flood which ruined the theater up top. August 2nd, 2021, just about 13 and a half months ago, this is halfway underwater. Morning of the 2nd, we estimate there's 7 million gallons of water that rushed over that dam that we'll walk across later on. That sent so much water heading inside of our cavern, I couldn't get in the last room in the cave for about a week. All the water over the years was also kind of messing up the steps. There's a little bit of erosion kicking in, so water going up and down, just take your time. Slow and steady wins it. I'm not in a really big rush to get inside the shop again. Don't be in a rush going up and down some steps. We'll take our time. We'll make our way a little bit slowly down inside. In just a second, the temperature is going to change up. That cave AC will kick in. It stays about 63 degrees inside of our cavern and is that temperature all year round down below. Starting to feel that cool cave air kick in. This is the air that I was mentioning they blasted out. This is the section we're going through in the stairs. Originally there was a natural opening to one being the peep in the deep and this archway opening through here. Before humans got involved, essentially the Cibolo Creek would rush through here inside the cavern. It's the main water force that carved everything we're about to see out. And from here forward, and before you get inside the cave, just make sure to use the handrail. Gonna get a little bit slippery, slow and steady we shall go. And also watch your head, ceiling's not gonna budge, I promise. Three 
real careful right through here, sir. What's your name? My name is John. John, okay. That's what I thought, but I didn't want to call you the wrong name. Before we enter the cave today, if you look up, you will stare through the peep in the deep that we were just staring down. This is where the cow once fell, the bucket once dropped you off, 65 feet below, only about halfway down for the day. Turn some more lights, we'll make our way inside. Watch your step, watch your head. See a little dip up and down a little bit. You're not afraid of bats, are you? No. Okay, cool. I'm not afraid of anything. There you go. Sorry, I'm going to shine a little bit of my light on my friend right here. Oh, it's not shining here, so I'm going to wake him up. This is Bruce. Bruce is a tri-colored bat. Let me show you real quick. So this is Bruce, but they're all named Bruce because that makes my life easier. I'll talk about this guy in a second. So this is Bruce, too. This is also a tri This is actually the adult size, too. Uh, typically, the tricolors are been about a chicken nugget size. It's not a lot bigger. They don't do the nightly fly-ups at sunset also. They're all on their own independent little schedules. So Bruce normally will sleep for about two weeks in a light hibernation. When he does wake up, it's only for about 30 minutes to an hour. Just a couple episodes of Netflix. Flies out, eats 80% of his body weight in bugs. He'll go to the bathroom outside, thankfully. Then he comes back, sleeps two more weeks, rinse and repeat. It's quite the life. I'm pretty jealous of Bruce most days. And there are there are there a lot of bats down here? This time of year, no, sir. We might see one or two more throughout our tour. Uh -huh. It's kind of the tail end of mating season for them, so they're kind of protecting the kids. Within <clears> the next <throat> month to a month and a half, they, these guys will start to migrate south of Mexico. And we'll start to get bats from the northeastern U.S. come down inside the waters. From November to like the middle of end of January is the high point of bats for us. The colony up northeast is a lot larger than ours. So today I would say like maybe four or five bats total. Come in November, December, I've seen at least 20 to 30 every single day where it's mm -hmm. We'll let these little guys rest. I don't want to wake them up. If they do sleep the full two weeks in one spot, they do return to the exact same spot. They do the area is safe for them. They do get woken up before the two weeks, they'll fly somewhere else. So this area is what we call the mirror lake. They call it that because any light you shine against the cave wall in the back, excuse me, pardon, any light you shine on the cave wall in the back does create a reflection on the water everywhere beneath that light. And all of the water that's inside a mirror lake is coming from above of a cave ceiling. Normally, it takes about seven years for the rainwater up top to seep through all of this limestone. Because it does take about seven years' time to kind of filter through, I legitimately trust the water falling from the cave ceiling more than it comes out of my faucet in San Antonio. So at any point, it's kind of dripping. You want to tilt your head back at a drink. No judgment. The tail is going to grow in a couple of days, but it falls off pretty quick afterwards. And there's enough of this water dripping down here that we actually do have to pump it out almost 24-7. We didn't pump water out of here. It takes about 12 hours to get knee deep here. So you, some areas get ankle high in three hours. So is it okay that if, while we're walking through the cave, if I flash the light on the on the on the caves, on the, yeah. it won't be it won't hurt them in any way. No, absolutely not. So we do use all LED lighting at this time period. In the past, they have used halogen-based lights, which did cause some algae growth. We're going to see a little bit of that now. We're really trying to fight that off. That's why our cave is a lot more dim lit than others you may go to in the state of Texas. Okay. It's because it's so active, it's very easy for things to grow down inside of here. Everything just needs a little bit of water, which the cave happily provides, and just a little bit of light. As we start to make our way further in, just kind of watch where your step's going. Good news is the ceiling's going to begin opening up for us. Starting to see some of this algae growth inside here. We did switch this bulb out to LED. We're still working on wattage. We began to use this kind of a system where they use a Carlsbad to kind of help alleviate algae. It's kind of a science experiment down inside. You're trying to find that right bend to protect the cave, make it as natural as we can down in. 
And this is the area I'll try to explain how we got into cave to begin with. Uh, go back in time, 120 million years, give or take a couple hours. Back then, half the state of Texas is under the Gulf of Mexico. So this wall is not limestone like the rest. All of this wall is a fossilized coral reef system. So essentially this entire wall is a gigantic fossil. For about 75% of the tour, as we head towards the back, you're going to be seeing the coral reef on the right slowly combining with the Glenrose limestone. Just in this spot, though, you can see there's little white pieces sticking out all over. These are all different types of fossils. We've got maybe bones, seashells. I even have a little starfish sticking out of this wall. This is Patrick's great-great-great-grandfather. Over 100 different types of these fossils are embedded just in this one wall. All that kind of made me wonder, how does any of this get in a cave? 20 million years ago, an earthquake hits. Makes this thing right above us. Above our heads is the Balcones fault line. This goes from Del Rio to Dallas. Number one reason we're here. The fault got created, water found a path, started rushing through. That water's carved and created everything we'll see down here today ever since. Which I think is really cool. I'm from the West Coast. My favorite fact about this fault line Zero seismic activity ever recorded on the Balcona. So we are safe. You can take a deep breath again. No rocking, no rolling, no pun intended. We're going to follow the falls all the way to the end today, too. Any point you're looking up and can see away, you're going to be staring at the Balconas. As we walk down the path for now, you can actually see where the water's been rushing through, carving, layering the cave walls over the years. You also see this stuff that kind of looks like icing on a cinnamon roll on the cave walls. That's calcite, that is the main mineral. As it begins to dry, it'll kind of have that icing appearance to it. When it completely dries, that's when it starts to look like Parmesan cheese, powdered sugar on the cave walls. In the caving world, the technical term for when it's very dry calcite is moon milk. You'll never convince me it's not more Parmesan cheese based in my opinion though. Making our way a little bit more, just gonna watch each step. The walls are gonna get a little bit narrow, the floor's a little more wet. Six feet on the other end of the wall is a reservoir of water. And if there's enough water back there, when you push forward, the water drips and streams down, and that makes everything we're looking at. We'll start with the pattern all over the walls. To me, it kind of looks like ramen noodles left in the snow or something. It's called flowstone, exactly like it sounds. The water flows over the stones, making the lines, splashes, making these pools. Every drip of water leaves minerals to all of the white, yellow, and orange in the cave is going to be calcite. There's some yellow and orange, there's likely some iron kind of playing a role in there as well. The green again is going to be algae, as so much as I'd love to tell you it's something like troll's blood. Again, we use halogenites for decades. We started using LEDs in 2015, and in this area specifically, I've already started to see the algae disappear. Cave years we're talking about, it's going to take a minute. And you'll notice towards the bottom, this almost looks squishy, sort of like it's made out of jello. Anything in the cave you see looking squishy means the water is still dripping on it and it's still growing up, which is the best thing to see, I think. When the water stops dripping, that calcite dries, that's when it'll start to crystallize and give you the shimmers, the shines on the cave wall. So throughout the tour, if the walls are sparkling at you, John, don't get that excited. It's calcite. There's no diamonds down here, unfortunately. But if you do find diamonds, you let me be alone know. We go 50-50. This weekend's looking a whole lot better for both of us. <laughs> which is totally understandably freaky after I talk about flooding for 15 minutes straight till I start to run out of here, we're good today, don't worry about nothing. So I'd like to welcome you to what I call the raining room. Uh, 
you may have started to figure out why it's called that. There's these little formations above our heads. In the caving world, they call them tubular stalactites. In the cave tour guiding world, we call them soda straws. They don't really get you about the size of a straw you're drinking your soda from. These are only made of water and calcite. When the water up top is heading towards the cave, it's carrying that calcite with it. Water rolls, calcite grows, starts to make these little straw formations. But because they're only made of water and calcite, they're really fragile and they do break easily. Which is why on this ceiling above us, they're all sort of different sizes. Flood waters, tall people come through, get knocked down, they have to start growing again. The good news is though, if any of the water from the straws falls and hits you, that's a cave kiss. We are supposed to be good luck for about a year. You're starting to feel the drops. Hey, congrats, keep going, keep collecting. That Powerball's getting up there again. There you go. Yeah. I can use a Powerball. Yeah, for real, same here. Talking about diamonds going 50-50. I'll go 50-50 if you on that one too. No, no problem. We're gonna make a kill on this weekend, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I know I get a bunch of my cave kisses right in here in our crouching section. Just a word of advice from my experience. If you're going through and you get a cave kiss right on the back of your neck, I promise it's not going to be worth jumping up about today. We'll crouch, we'll make our way forward. Rail to your right if you want to use it. Now I see some more green. Is that the algae too? Correct. Yes, sir. It's right. long the floor is a technical term. Even though we have switched to LED, what we've been discovering over the past few years is if the wattage is still too high on the LEDs, it can still lead to algae growth. That's what I'm kind of saying is like a science experiment. We've got to figure out the right wattage and everything on the LEDs to help it go away. If not, we'd have to start using different kind of solutional things to help that algae go away. As you start to make your way around these corners, just watch where your head is going. We do have a few more low-hanging formations right in through here. In the 1960s, there's a special tour out here. There had been a group of nuns in the area doing mission work. They'd taken a break to see the cave. And when they turned the corner like we just did, one of the nuns locked eyes with this area of the cave right through here. Uh, to her and several others, it sort of looks like there's a skull staring right back at you. Uh, apparently something about nuns and skulls doesn't really cross well because she saw this and ran out of here as fast as she could. Entire time describing us a passageway to the underworld and different language, we'll say. Apparently, they could calm her down. They're convinced, she was convinced that it's the catacombs, the Cascade Caverns, tried to explain that it's a limestone to no success. She went back to where she is from and tells a minister about this cave full of demons in Central Texas. He comes to base a visit, not wearing his garb, he's standing in the back of the tour until he gets to this lovely little school. He then pulled a vial full of holy water out of his pocket left and right douses the area and provided a blessing 
Because of him, I'm very happy to say that we are 100% evil spirit free since 1963. And I also believe that's why the angel wings started to grow above the skull. Keep all those bad spirits away. And I'll say this, I've worked here for a while. I've never even seen a ghost inside of this cave, let alone a demon. So I'm very grateful for the minister's work for us. We start to make our way forward to the next room. Just watch where your head's going a little more. We've got a few more low-hanging formations. After that, we'll get some easier walking room for a little bit. Pirates of the Caribbean, kind of all squid-like mechanically. That's me. You can imagine whatever you can. There's no wrong answers down here. To prove that, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody pointed out this formation to me, and while I think it looks like a beehive, they thought it looked like a rock. So there's no wrong answers inside of the imagination room. You're more than welcome to look around and imagine what you can. Remind me to get from the last one, I'll tell you about another tour we have that's like real hardcore cave-in. It's a crazy kind of thing. Not my cup of tea, but it sounds like it might be yours. Mm -hmm. For that, though, I gotta talk about this little piece sticking out of the wall up here. So this is another fossil. This is a mastodon shin bone. A mastodon is sort of like a saber-toothed tiger sized up to be as big as a woolly mammoth. This is just the shin bone, and it goes about four feet heading into the wall going that way. We know that because after they found this after a flood in the 80s, they had some archaeology students come out. They had this device, it's like an x-ray camera essentially, it'll take scans, it'll shoot six feet through rock. They take a lot of scans of this area and the wall behind it. They realized they started digging in, they believe they can pull about 50% of that skeleton out, start trying to reassemble it. Issue is, we can't even touch the cave, let alone dig in to pull bones out. Gotta wait for time and nature to push these fossils out for us. Don't necessarily recommend holding your breath on that one. I'm gonna take a few hundred to a thousand. Well, keep heading down. I do recommend hanging onto the rail. It's a little bit slick. All of these domes are created when the cave is really getting flooded. When all the water is rushing inside the cavern, the amount of pressure behind it kind of forces its way through. As the water is moving, it begins to spin, forming a whirlpool. As the whirlpool is moving throughout the cavern, it starts to get bigger and faster. While it's getting speed and size, the flood waters are rising up, forcing the whirlpools up. They eventually can get stuck in one spot, the water's still forcing them, spins and spins, so leaves nothing behind to these perfect domes. Very first solution, like, oh hey buddy, a bat line. That was a bat, right? Yeah, it was. Cool. I'm surprised it's this far back. Usually they're really lazy to hang out by the front door. Hey, settle down, settle down. Hey. So the very first solution dome we saw today was actually the peak of the D. 65 foot hole in the ground we stared through at the start with underground like these, and eventually over time the water was able to shoot its way to the surface. 
Eventually, these are also going to get disappeared and the solution domes will get their way to the top. Thankfully, from here, there's at least 65 feet of solid rock separating these from the surface. We're not going away soon. What freaks me out, though, is the brown color. You see light in the ceiling way up there. All of that brown is mud from the flood of 2002. So just 20 years ago, this is how much water is standing, where we're standing right now. Yeah. And we'll see how much water got inside this cave 13 months back last August. We'll also see about 96 more of those domes to make our way inside of our last room. So this is the largest room in the cavern today. This is called the Cathedral Room. To give it the name Cathedral Room at first, because as the fault is still traveling down the center of the ceiling, the first explorers this far back also see this line going through it, and to them, they thought that it made it look like a giant cross hanging from the ceiling above, so they named it the Cathedral Room, and that name's lasted us ever since. Buddy, point around there and there. Oh, kind of looking up top, too. Uh, you can kind of see the shadow of my finger waving around the dark brown spotted line on the ceiling. That is the flood line from August 2nd last year. Just about 13 and a half months back, that's how much water is standing where we're standing right now. We're at our lowest point for today, 135 feet below. Right now, you're more than welcome. Take a look around the room, that's where either pathway in here. And is the water that's running down from the side, is it always running? No, sir. So this is an artificial waterfall. The main original water source that came from groundwater, a flood in 67 blocked that pathway. And so from 67 to 2017, there was originally no waterfall. But in 2017, we started using part of the water we pumped out of the cave, send it up and send it back down to recreate the fall. But because we're using that natural cave water, it's also letting those formations begin to resume growing again as well. Down here, I can show you the other two or see if you're interested. So you see the ladder over here? Mm -hmm. That tube? That ladder goes through a drain tube. That drain tube goes 20 feet straight down. There's a ladder attached to it. So we do another tour where you climb down the ladder, climb down the drain tube 20 feet, crawl out backwards, hike 80 feet deeper down about 235 below and you swim inside the Trinity Aquifer where Austin to Oklahoma get their water from. That's the adventure tour. I don't leave that. I'm claustrophobic. They need to pay me a lot more money to go back down there. But it sounds like that might be your cup of tea. Oh, definitely. I'll be back for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you look around. If you have any questions, just let me know. And we call these the twin sisters because they are two largest and closest to being able to touch stalactites, stalagmites. You can always remember the differences because stalactites stick tight to the ceiling and a stalagmite might reach the top. So any other cave you're going to, they'll likely tell you it takes a hundred years or more for these to grow just an inch. That's not true down here though. We have such a wet cave system, everything drips quicker, minerals deposit faster. Here it only takes about 20 years to grow an inch. Really good means in comparison. If this big combination were anywhere else, that would likely take 500, 600 years to build these connected. But because it's in Cascade Caverns, it's only 100, 120 years. Stalag tight, stalag might, will stalag meet and form a column like you see right through. So, if you want to come back in 120 years, we're going to get a brand new tour around here. Get a few more cave kisses, hold on to the ticket, it'll get you back in for free in 120 years. We'll see if the elevator's done by then. I got a lot of doubts about that one, unfortunately. And for now, we'll start to make our way forward again. While we're making our way, just watch where your head is rolling. A lot of low hanging formations moving forward. These formations are really starting to kind of grow on you about how much I like them and appreciate them. 
I've been trying to think of like a way to properly incorporate it in my tours. It's just beautiful. You can see where it's still growing very actively. You see the flowstone kind of rolling down inside the stalactite. It's gorgeous. This is Sally Mander. She's the Cascade Cavern Salamander. She's actually a vulnerable species. These salamanders are primarily only really known to be inside of our cave system. They've adapted really well. For one thing, they'll never leave the water. Most of the times when a salamander becomes an adult, they'll lose their gills and walk on land. But these salamanders have adapted to keep the gills. They can travel no matter their age from this cave to the lower system where the other tour goes down to. Down there, they're safer from the flood waters, and there's more bugs for them to eat to get some protein that they can't really find up here. Is that the only one? No, we might see some more here in just a second. I just saw this guy kind of moving around. I will say that this is the standard size of the salamanders. They can get larger, but not by a whole lot. The signs on the gift shop are pretty misleading about the lengths of these creatures. Let's see if we got any more in here. Okay, so we finished our uh, trip down into the Cascade Caverns, great tour guide. Hey, thanks a lot for watching this video. Go ahead and check out my YouTube channel playlist for Texas Caverns, and I'll see you next time. Bye.